Good evening, everyone. <laughs> uh, my name is Dave Cochran, and on behalf of Loris College and the Dubuque Area um, International Day of Peace Coordinating Committee, welcome to this year's keynote address. Now back in person, thank goodness, as well as uh, streaming as well. Um, excellent. So it is uh, great to see so many people here again uh, returning to our annual International Day of Peace keynote, uh, as well as all of those joining uh, on the streaming. Uh, this year's keynote is also co-sponsored by the Dubuque NAACP and its president, uh, Anthony Allen, and Dubuque Area Congregations United and its president, um, Gene Holdener. Uh, so just a few preliminary matters uh, before we get started. Um, as you, most of you know and can tell, uh, Loris uh, requires masks in indoor buildings, so um, uh, please uh, respect that as well as we've tried to distance the chairs somewhat um, um, for COVID. Uh, exits, any of these doors lead to exits um, on any of these three sides of the building. That's a sheer cliff, so don't try and go that way. Uh, bathrooms are through this door uh, in the hallway right next to the information desk. Uh, there's also, of course, our um, traditional gauntlet of peace, all the tables back there uh, with various literature, petitions. Uh, so make sure you check that out and um, uh, talk to the good people back there. There's also uh, books for sale by the Loris Bookstore, um, our speaker's book, and she is willing to sign copies of the book after the event if you'd like to have a signed copy as well. Um, so this is our 11th year uh, celebrating the United Nations International Day of Peace. Um, in addition to our keynote, which we have in this room um, each year, um, there's a variety of events that happen uh, both before and after around the Dubuque area. Uh, there's full info on the flyers that are in the back on the table, and we've also taped up some on the walls on the side, so if you want to just take a picture with your phone, you can get all the information about events uh, coming up. Uh, just to whet your appetite, things we still have coming up, um, September 22nd, colonization, um, colonization and indigenous justice here at Loris. Um, the hike uh, to help refugees on Friday the 24th um, walks between Loris, University of Dubuque, and Clark University. Um, September 25th is the Rally for Peace by the Coalition for Nonviolence in Washington Park. Uh, the 26th is the Ecumenical Peace Vespers out at Divine Word College. Uh, the 27th is the Captain Robert L. Martin Black Heritage Tribute Kickoff, uh, which has multiple uh, locations around town. September 28th is the story of Nathaniel Morgan, a very interesting story that more people should know about. That's going to be at the University of Dubuque. Um, and September 29th is um, Rise Above the Tuskegee Airmen Traveling Outdoor Exhibit at the Dubuque Regional Airport. Uh, so again, the more details are available on our website, on the flyers, or take a picture uh, with your phone. Um, I would like to thank members of our coordinating committee uh, for planning this and the other events uh, that we're sponsoring. We're also always looking for new members, um, especially younger members. Uh, to give you an idea, our average age makes me probably like the youngest member on the committee, uh, except for Hannah. Uh, so, um, so the more members we have, the better to plan these events. There are sign-up sheets uh, on our table, and uh, we just meet once a month for about an hour and put together uh, things uh, throughout the year. Um, and of course, I'd like to acknowledge um, Barbara Ilton, our committee's president for the last few years, uh, and then Brian McLaughlin, who's going to be our incoming president. There's Brian, I see him back there. Um, mm -hmm. 
Uh, so that's enough for me. I'd like to introduce um, Jean Holdner, who is the president of Dubuque Area Congregations United, to introduce our speaker tonight. Mm -hmm. Thank you and welcome. Good evening. My name is Jean Holdener, and I grew up as a military dependent, raised by a Midwestern family in Georgia. And years later, I somehow found myself marrying into a Catholic family, myself only a Protestant. So it's rather an interesting day when Sunday comes along or when conversations of uh, faith and understanding comes about. But I now have found myself as the president of Dubuque Area Congregations United. And in that, I have discovered that I continue to listen faithfully to God's purpose and plan for myself and serving in my community or in any aspect that I discover I needed. And in that, I am currently serving as a delegate member in DACU, and I'm also trying to provide its board, its leadership. And in that mission, Dubuque Area Congregations United simply identifies ourselves as people of a diverse faith and beliefs. We are united by our belief in God and our concerns for justice and all that we are called to serve. Through our prayerful dependence on God and our respectful cooperation with each other, we will make a difference in our world by fostering an awareness and understanding of human need. We will be a supportive presence in this community and beyond through our generous sharing of our time, talents, and resources. Now, we have about 39 delegate members across this area, and many of them are probably here tonight. We also have several other members, associate members, and representatives of various community organizations. Many of them are probably here tonight. Our community has endured a profound period of challenges, and DACU's programming and events continue to listen, learn, and shift in order for us to provide more meaningful assistance and change. Our interfaith communities are anxious to find ways to address systemic racism and to provide justice in all lives. Ladies and gentlemen, tonight I have the honor of introducing our keynote speaker for the Dubuque International Day of Peace, and that's Olga Marina Segura. Olga has a talented and moving voice that has both highlighted and guided readers to a clear understanding of our past, our present, with some hope towards our future. Olga has also been an associate editor for America Media, writing and solicited for articles covering various race and culture topics. She is a co-founder and former co-host of a podcast called Joe's Jesuitical. I'm still trying to figure out the pronunciation of that one. My husband and I both had a very interesting conversation about it. But this writing, her writing, has appeared in a variety of publications, The Guardian, Latino Rebels, Shondaland, Sojourners, Refinery29, and Revealer, and there's probably others. But in her youth, she has also served as an intern. And this is the, for the permanent mission of the Dominican Republic with the United Nations. She is a graduate of the Fordham University, and she graduated with both a Bachelor of Arts in English and a Bachelor of Arts in Italian Language and Literature. So this means that she probably speaks a lot, very fluently, of both Italian and Spanish. But recently, she has been able to publish a book with all that's going on, Birth of a Movement, Black Lives Matter and the Catholic Church. In this public publication, she is providing us some information, a message, which seeks to bring about a call to action, an opportunity to share in her own spiritual journey, and some clarification on church teachings. In this, though, she also identifies or clarifies herself as being simply a writer from the Bronx, where she has spent this lockdown time preparing this message, putting this information together, something that ties together both the Catholic Church and the Black Lives Matter. I believe that Olga tonight has an important message for us all to hear and share tonight. Please join me in welcoming Olga Marina Segura. Give me a 
quick second as I awkwardly take my mask off. One moment. Oh boy, this is awkward. Okay. much a millennial that doesn't print um, her talks, but okay. Can you guys hear me all right? Ooh, okay. More? More? Down? Yeah. Does this work? Yeah. Oh, okay, cool. My, it sounded really loud to me, but it should sound loud. So thank you, Jean, for that introduction. Thank you, Dave, and good evening to everyone. Um, thank you all for being here with me today, this evening, and thank you to everyone who's tuning in via live stream, and I just want to thank everyone at the Loris College community for inviting me to speak to you all this evening, and thank you, Dave, for the work and patience in getting me out here. I'm not the best at email, so thank you for that. This is my first in-person event as an author, my first time talking about my work face-to-face -face since the pandemic started last year, and I'm so grateful to be sharing my message with you all today. So I wanna to start today with the Black Lives Matter movement because it's the foundation of so much of my work, what the movement is and the role it's played in my professional and spiritual life. So this movement help, really helped me to begin to decolonize my Christianity before I even knew to call it decolonizing my Christianity. And it really helped me to stay in the church at a time when I was really, really disillusioned with the church. I was working in Catholic media. I had graduated from Fordham, so I went from one really white space to another really white space, and that made it really, really difficult for me because Christianity started to look, Catholicism started to look very different from the very black immigrant experience that I had in the Bronx. And I began reporting on this, on this movement at a time when I really, really needed it. And it helped me to understand and to begin to recognize that the gospel was a tool for justice, it was a tool for liberation. And I began reporting on the Black Lives Matter movement in 2014. This was the start of my professional career, just a few years into my time at American Media. And again, this was, it became explicitly, in my, it was very explicit in my face just how Irish Catholic um, it was when we talked about our faith. When we talk about Catholicism in this country, it's always through the lens of whiteness, and this became very, very apparent to me the further along I got into my career in media. And I was looking for stories that reflected the spirituality of my mother, the spirituality of my grandmother, my aunts and uncles, and again, the very Bronx world that I knew. So in 2013, following the acquittal of George Zimmerman and the killing of Trayvon Martin, Alicia Garza, Patrice Cullors, and Opal Timetti created the Black Lives Matter movement. And these are three black women, two identifying as queer, who have each been organizing for more than 10 years around issues like immigration rights, housing justice, reproductive justice, police violence, abolition. And at the time, it was mostly an online campaign on Twitter and Facebook, and they wanted to use the hashtag in the initial stages to really help empower organizers, especially young organizers all around the country, by giving them the resources on how to get involved in the fight for racial justice and how to talk about racial justice, how to use digital tools to do this work. And in the summer of 2014, the founders, along with more than 400 organizers from all across the United States, traveled to Ferguson, Missouri following the shooting death of Michael Brown Jr. And these organizers, a majority of whom were women and men in the LGBTQ community, helped to support the marchers who are facing daily violence from law enforcement. And after that summer, many of the activists returned to their respective cities and started their own local BLM chapters using the resources and knowledge they gained that summer, and many of which have now become part of the BLM network we see in 2021. Years later, this movement has grown to include chapters all across the country, providing resources on restorative justice, conflict resolution, and on how to organize. And along with marching across American streets, many of these organizers, including those outside of the movement, were also using the hashtag to educate people like me who had never talked about police brutality openly or who, never, who had never engaged with abolitionist work before. And this was a movement that since its inception has always promoted inclusion, it affirms and censors the experiences of black, queer, and trans women and men. And it works toward a world where all black people are liberated and free, and by extension, all people. So the more I learned about this movement, the more I reported on it, the more I really, really began to internalize its mission. I started attending protests and interviewing activists I met back in 2014 and 2015. 
and I met organizers of all age groups who were talking about issues, again, issues and topics that I had yet to engage with at that point in my professional life. And I also started talking with other black Catholics who were also trying to understand what this movement was and how it could play a role in our faith. The more I engaged with these thinkers, the more I read about the movement, the more I read about the founders' experiences, the more I began to follow and read social critics outside of the movement who embodied the tenets that I saw that the movement was promoting. And the more I began to start to think, how does this connect with my faith? How does this connect with the Catholic social teaching that was surrounding me? I was, again, at America, very Jesuit space, working with priests, and I began to think, okay, I'm seeing a lot of similarities. How can I begin to connect these dots? So I followed a lot of black intellectuals like Sahira Kelly, Zoe Sarmudzi, Dwayne David Paul, William C. Anderson. And these thinkers were like the founders and organizers of the Black Lives Matter movement, using social media to help their followers think more deeply about blackness and the diaspora, colorism, white supremacy, colonialism, the dangers of consumerism. I started to see the communities I was from in this movement, immigrants, black, women, at a time when I was trying to understand my own faith, my identity, the movement really allowed me to begin to deconstruct much of the conditioning that I've internalized since I, since I arrived in the United States in the early 90s. I began to think about what it means to identify as a black immigrant with light skin. I began to think about my own privilege and what it means to challenge the white supremacist ideals that immigrants of, like me are fed even before we set foot in American airports. And I began to challenge my family to do the same. So we had to have a lot of difficult conversations because if any of you are familiar with Dominicans or the Dominican community, we are very anti-black and we do not like talking about it. So I had to have a lot of difficult conversations with myself and with the people that I loved. And I started to think more deeply about white supremacy, misogyny, imperialism. Black Lives Matter and other social justice movements and organizations like the Sunrise Movement, Dream Defenders, are teaching Americans, especially millennials and younger, how to organize, how to talk about oppression, how to be in solidarity at a time of social distancing and limited in-person contact. It helped me, to be, again, to begin to decolonize my Christianity, and most importantly, how to center voices that weren't getting a platform in our church and also in our media. And all of this conscientiousness altered my faith in my relationship to our church. These movements taught me how to be Catholic, they taught me how to be a Catholic writer, how to live out what Pope Francis has been preaching throughout his papacy. And along with reporting on the Black Lives Matter movement, as I was doing this reporting, I, as I was engaging with thinkers and people who were involved in this movement, I was also reading church doctrine for the first time. That was not something I did in college. I didn't read encyclicals. I, didn't, I couldn't name a pope before Pope Francis, aside from Benedict and JP too. But for the first time, I was actually engaging with Catholicism at a, on a theological level. And this was, again, thanks to a racial justice movement that really challenged me to step outside of my own experience, my own comfort, and actively, work, actively and consistently work toward making our church better. And in order for me to do that, then I had to engage with these teachings. I had to engage with the actual words that Pope Francis was saying. And this also meant recognizing and learning for the very first time just how complicit the American church had been in the sin of slavery, what its racial justice efforts have been throughout the American church's history, and how, is, how it has failed in a lot of these efforts. And thanks to the work of a lot of other black Catholic scholars like Tia Noel Pratt, Shannon D. Williams, Cynthia Butler, and countless others, I was able to understand more fully how the Catholic Church has internalized white supremacy from its birth to the present day and more fully connect the dots between the mission of this movement and the mission of our church. So I would start with that background because it's the foundation for how I write and think about building a more equitable world. It is the foundation for what I believe my faith calls me to do. This movement gave me a framework to talk about justice, to talk about liberation. This movement helped me understand that no one is free unless every single person is free. And it really forced me to use that language, to use that language when I was talking to other Catholics and when I was trying to spread any kind of message in, in our church. And for me, after sitting with this, after sitting with everything that this movement was, was teaching me and the more I thought about liberation, the more I thought about what it meant to 
center the people from my world, what it meant to center people from my community, but also talk to white Catholics, talk to white people about being athletes, athletes, Lord, not athletes, allies. <laughs> For me, this begins with my writing. For me, it begins with being a storyteller. And this movement helped me to start to say that publicly. I, it might be shocking to a lot of you, but for most of my 20s, I didn't think about myself as a writer. I thought that I was just someone who was in media and who would figure it out at some point. And I didn't really start to call myself a writer until this movement helped me to challenge how we talk about storytelling. And my vocation is to be a storyteller, it's to be an editor. And this movement helped me understand that storytelling for people from my community, black immigrants, women, storytelling has always been spiritual for us. It's always been religious for us. As an immigrant, I have always existed in two worlds. I have always thought and communicated in two languages since I was a young child. My mother does not speak fluent English. So I've been translating since before I could remember. I've been helping my mother navigate her space in this country that has never really accepted her and I have always stepped in that role. I have always existed in that role like many immigrants. As immigrants, we have to be translators, we have to be reporters, we have to be journalists, and sometimes we have to be poets and comedians. We are all storytellers and this movement helped me to understand that there was power in that because when your voice and the voices of your loved ones have been ignored or erased for so long from everything, from how we worship, how we think, how we socialize, to how we create art, storytelling becomes a part of everything that we do and it's political. It, there's no way for me to tell you that my writing is not political because we have been historically erased. So for us it's political and it's regenerative and it's what keeps me doing this work. And it's, it's how we survive in a world that's not built for our survival. And storytelling has always been how we imagine and fight for a world where we matter, not just as workers, not just as people who produce products so that a handful of people can get really, really wealthy, but also as human beings with, dignities, with dignity. Stories are also a way to be in community with God's people. This movement, reporting on this, my work in Catholic spaces, helped me to fully internalize this, that this was a way to talk about God's creation. This was a way to center people who have been voiceless. And this is how I could help people to think about these things. This is how I could help to center marginalized communities. And the movement, again, solidified that for me. The movement really solidified that for me, writing and now editing, because I'm back in editing, is, and I'm gonna borrow a phrase here from one of my favorite pieces of art this year, Bo Burnham's Inside. If anyone follows me on Twitter, you know that I rant about Bo Burnham a lot, but he has a line where he says, you know, I wanna leave the world better than I found it. And that is what storytelling is for me. Storytelling is a way to help people think about a better world, to help people imagine what it means to live outside of the clutches of white supremacy. And along with my reporting on this movement, I've also talked to black and brown student activists fighting against racism on campuses. I've interviewed black creators about the healing power of literature and filmmaking. And I've written commentary articles to challenge white Americans to become authentic allies in the fight for liberation. And as an editor at the National Catholic Reporter, with the support of executive editor Heidi Schlumpf, I actively and consistently search for voices and ideas that are not given a platform in Catholic religious media. I have writers who are really grappling with the ways that capitalism, especially during the pandemic, has failed us. Writers who are grappling with purity culture and the whiteness of teenage representation on screen. Writers who are talking about how hip hop has served as a consolation for queer black activists following the uprising last summer against anti-black violence. By centering these voices and stories, I am working to create the liberatory spaces and faith I wanted when I was coming of age in this church. By centering these voices, I can challenge white Catholics and all white people engaging in my work to more fully understand Christianity's role in European imperialism and colonialism and its role in the oppression of my people. And this doesn't mean I'm calling any of you here today or anyone who's engaging with my work to renounce the Catholic faith or to renounce any faith, but I want you to, to think more deeply about how we are conditioned to worship and believe. 
how white supremacy has allowed the faith to uplift certain voices and empower countless believers around the world while also oppressing countless others. We must understand this history, the tensions and struggles that exist in Catholic spaces and all faith communities, because these spaces are also part of how we can build a freer, more beautiful, more loving world. And the urgency in everything that, that I've been uh, telling you guys here today is, is necessary. I know it's, it's really difficult to talk about imperialism and to talk about capitalism and to talk about all of these things when we know that our material conditions have not changed and we still need these things to survive. But the urgency in this is needed because it's become an inextricable part of my work in the last year, especially working throughout the pandemic. In December of 2019, I left my full-time job as an associate editor at American Media to freelance and write my first book. And I originally conceived of this book as sort of gentle accompaniment. I think I've, I've mentioned this in the book, so this might be familiar to folks, but I envisioned a writing project that would be the Catholic version of how to be an anti-racist, how to do this type of work. And I really wanted to make white people feel comfortable. I was really, really worried with white people accepting my work, praising my work. Like many people of color, we, we are conditioned to, to want this praise. And to put it frankly, I was just afraid of upsetting white people. I was really, really scared of white people not liking me. But then 2020 happened. And I'm from New York. The COVID-19 pandemic has killed, the COVID-19 pandemic has killed countless Americans. And in my hometown, more than 30,000 people have lost their lives. Thousands have lost health insurance, jobs, savings, their homes. Along with being disproportionately affected by this pandemic, black and brown communities continue to face violence at the hands of armed police officers. In 2020 alone, more than 800 people died at the hands of American police officers. And by last summer, anti-police protests erupted all across the United States. And as I was processing all of these tragedies happening around me. As I was trying to write my first book, my loved ones got sick with COVID. My dad, my partner's father, um, many of the educators that I know, every single one of my friends, most of my friends are educators in New York City and they were terrified, right? Our, our government wasn't really equipped to handle what happened in New York in those early stages. Friends lost relatives, jobs. Every week, someone I knew and loved told me about someone that they lost a relative, a sister, a brother, a love, a, another loved one. And amid all that, amid all of that death, amid all of the devastations that were happening, cops were still shooting black Americans. Violence against transgender women and men was still rising. And so this book and all of the work that I do has become more urgent. This year, along with the pandemic and anti-racism uprising we are seeing in the US and have continued to see in the US and around the world, we have also seen political leaders on the left and right weaponize Christianity. And within the Catholic Church, we continue to see the disconnect between the church's leadership and the suffering of marginalized communities. And again, the book and my work can no longer be gentle. It became as urgent as I have felt this year, as urgent as I felt last year, and as tired, as afraid, as devastated. And I no longer care about consoling my feelings. I care about struggling toward a world where black people and all indigenous people of color are free. And as such, I am committed as an editor, as a writer, to center and uplift not just the joys of my community, but the trauma and suffering of it as well. Along with working on my book last year, 2020 was also the first year that I was freelancing full time. And every month, I received a piece of hate mail every single month, and I, I like to share this story because I think it proves the larger point that, that I'm making in this talk. And every single one of these messages were from Catholic white men. This was easily confirmed because they all shared their Gmail, their addresses, or their Twitter handles, or their names and their signatures. And a lot of them were angry because I wrote about a handful of things. I wrote about whiteness in the UFO community, some were angry because I profiled a black gay priest, others because I criticized bishops. All called me uninformed about my faith, politics, and race. And I read every single one of these messages, and I dismissed most of them as harmless, because most of them were harmless. But there were a few that were really, really violent. And these are the ones that I dissected word for word. And I wanted to memorize every single one of these lines. I wanted to memorize 
the tone, the description of violence against me, against my family, because I thought that this was how I was going to steel myself against this rhetoric in the future. I thought, I need to internalize this as much as I can, because then I won't be surprised in the future. If anyone in here suffers from anxiety, they know exactly what I'm talking about. And so I internalized this violence. I internalized this really, really deeply. And again, I was working on my first book, and I was extremely anxious. I barely ate. This was last summer, June, July. I was barely eating. I wasn't leaving my house by August. I had what I would now call a mild case of agoraphobia. I was really terrified to leave because I was so afraid of the world. I was afraid of my church. I was afraid of the commentary that I knew white men in my church were sending my way. For six weeks, June to July, I woke up every single day at 5 a.m. and wrote nonstop for five or six hours. I ignored my partner, barely speaking to him for longer than 20 minutes at a time. My anxiety was getting worse and worse as I attempted to write and process every single thing that was happening around me. I was zealously poring over every single COVID-19 death, every murder at the hands of armed white racists, every change in the Trump administration, every racist comment by a member of our church. By the end of the summer, I rarely left my home, and I worried whenever my partner left our apartment. I worried that he would be stopped by law enforcement. I worried that he would get sick on the train. I worried that some awful racist thing would happen at his workplace. And slowly I learned that anxiety was also physical. For months at a time, I couldn't walk without back, shoulder, or chest pain. And I rarely ate without a subsequent wave of nausea. Anxiety was a part of my vocation, my ministry. This is what I told myself. Again, I was like, you know, I can internalize this rhetoric. I can internalize all these awful things because this was what it meant to do this work. And in order to change, I had to internalize all of this. And these things are not an anomaly. This is, I'm not the only woman of color in this church who has experienced this. This is America. This is the Catholic Church. Catholic women of color have shared similar stories with me in private. Online and in our daily lives, from our faith leaders who denigrate social justice movements to the insurrectionists who stormed the Capitol earlier this year, white violence permeates every part of our lived experiences. Confronted by a religious media landscape seemingly unwilling to cover this insidious aspect of white supremacy, we find solace in the liberatory spaces we've all carved, we have all carved out for each other over Twitter, emails, texts, video chats, and calls. These spaces, free of white men, white women, are exclusively ours, liberated from our church's white Catholicism. And it was in these spaces where we analyzed the insurgency in real time, unsurprised at the violence and habitual white Catholic responses from the left and right. This was not America, many proclaimed, because our country represented more than white violence, more than white rage. Yet this, was, this is exactly what this country, what this church has always been for women like us. For better or worse, American democracy was born out of violence and continues to be sustained by systems that exploit, torture, and incarcerate marginalized citizens. From prisons to detention centers to Silicon Valley to our healthcare system, to our very church. I scrolled social media for hours that Wednesday of January 6, and many women expressed the same question. Were Congresswomen of color okay? Were staffers of color okay? Those who cooked, cleaned, kept our leaders safe? Generational wounds have taught us that white male rage saves the worst of its violence for people of color. So as images after images of, and video after video surfaced of that event and other events that have happened last year and this year, we waited and suffered together. The United States has always encouraged such white rage and violence. European colonizers, angered by the treatment they received in their homelands, arrived on Turtle Island and violently stormed and pillaged, land, pillaged lands that were not theirs. Colonizers raped and murdered and profited from this violence, selling enslaved African women, men, and children. The creation of new technology at the turn of the 20th century meant more reforms, more reformed sanitized systemic violence against citizens of color. Segregation, voting restrictions, redlining prisons, detention centers. The United States of America, as of 2021, 
has the highest number of incarcerated people. And our inequitable healthcare system has caused, has been a part in, has played a huge role in the, in the deaths of more than 500,000 Americans. Black and Latinx citizens continue to be disproportionately affected by the pandemic, with women of color making up the majority of unemployment rates. Black mothers continue to receive inadequate medical care, from primary care physicians denying their pain to higher maternal mortality rates. Indigenous teens face the highest rates of suicide rate, face the highest rates of suicide and domestic abuse. Asian American women are most likely to remain unemployed longer than six months. And the Asian community continues to be harassed and assaulted by racists all across the country. And US black and Latinx transgender women are three times more likely to be killed. Americans of color also face higher rates of stress, excuse me, anxiety, depression, and are more likely to suffer a heart attack or stroke. I am sharing these statistics and my own story and those of other women of color today because white people in our church need to understand that along with the various tragedies that you guys see every single day in the news threatening our livelihood, we are also suffering anxiety, depression. We are spiritually devastated. We are spiritually suffering. And this is also violence every single day that's enacted upon our communities, our lives. And to fight for liberation means that we must fight to free communities like mine from any kind of suffering. So how can you all use this knowledge to begin to build community power? How can you use this knowledge to fight for liberation, to build a more equitable world? If we are called to be anti-imperialists, which I believe my faith calls me to be, and to use whatever resources we can allocate to ease the suffering of others, from our, Haitian, from our Haitian brothers and sisters in Haiti and at the border to our brothers and sisters in Afghanistan. What does this look like practically? White people in our church and country need to recognize and relinquish the power that white people, white Catholics in particular, hold in this country. In 2020, we saw white Catholics engaging with the uprising against police violence, and many were actively and consistently raising funds for organizers and using their various platforms to urge fellow white Catholics to support people of color who were being disproportionately affected by COVID-19. Many hosted Zoom book clubs and webinars where they discussed many of the topics that I've mentioned here tonight, and many have listened and learned from women and men of color. All of these efforts are important and they must continue. But they are not enough, and white Catholics, both lay and clergy, cannot get complacent. Primarily white Catholic and religious institutions, from hospitals to, academic, to, ac to academics to schools to media, must create positions in their respective fields for people of color. One of the many consequences of white supremacy, not just in the United States, but all across the world, is that the people most impacted by the evils of systemic oppression are also simultaneously internalizing the very racist norms of our oppressors. This is why I share my own unlearning of Dominican anti-blackness and privilege. This is why we have so many Latinos who also voted for Trump. Catholic and religious media in particular have to get better about covering our varied, li our varied lived experiences and beliefs, beginning with allowing us to tell our own stories. White faith leaders and communities also play a huge role in public policy in the United States. We saw just how intensely both presidential candidates campaigned for specific religious communities and leaders last year, in particular Christian Catholic voters. I would love to see more faith leaders and white allies communities this year figuring out how to protest during a pandemic and then using their organizing power, whatever that might look like wherever you are, to challenge oppressive systems across the country and raise funds or any kind of support that you can for black and brown organizers, especially women who are organizing on the ground all across the country. And to conclude, from September 1st to October 4th is the season of creation. And this year's theme is a home for all, renewing the oikos of God. I'm sorry if I butchered that right there. Um, but this year, Pope Francis invites all of us to participate to question the way we live and to turn towards lifestyles that are simpler and more respectful of the environment. And I wanted to end with this today because this is a question that I'm thinking about a lot, especially as someone who 
this is the first summer that I have had to really grapple with what the climate change, with what the climate crisis will look like in New York City with all the storms that we've been having. And I have been uh, guilty of not um, doing as much intersectional work when it comes to climate ch change as I should be. So this year, I'm thinking actively about what it means to center communities most impacted by these crises, what it means to fight for these communities. And I invite you all to do the same, right? Because all of this work is connected. When we talk about racial justice, when we talk about dismantling systemic oppression, we're also talking about climate change. And so I wanna end by just echoing Pope Francis's call and inviting you all to internalize the words that I'm sharing with you guys tonight to learn from this message and to not be afraid. I know these, these are really scary topics to talk about and it's, it's not easy. This work is not meant to be easy, but this work is meant to be done and we can do this together because we have the resources in our faith to do this. And so I hope this, this resonated with you all today. Uh, so, uh, so Olga has kindly um, agreed to take some questions, some discussion, response, um, conversation. Um, uh, Shell and I have microphones. We ask that you not speak until you get the microphone, just because this room is hard to hear, masks, and for the people watching online uh, so they can hear. Just raise your hand, and uh, we'll bring it, uh, the microphone to you. Hi, Olga. Hi. Uh, my name is Art Roach. I was a part of the planning committee that uh, that made the brilliant decision to ask you to come here, and, and you made the brilliant decision to accept our invitation. <laughs> Thank, Thank you. you. <laughs> so I have two questions. The first question is, wow. Just, that was fabulous. Second question is this. Um, in your book, I was struck, I read, I'm about three quarters of the way through, so if the butler did it, don't tell me. <laughs> no spoilers. Okay. But um, I, I was struck by throughout, in, in, in all the different chapters, you, you name names and you say their names. Mm -hmm. And to a white ear, that kind of sounds like the same thing. I know it's not. Uh, calling, calling out names, you, you name bishops and popes and presidents and CEOs and police chiefs and, and policemen and generally white men in power. And in saying their names, you didn't just say 35 black and brown women were killed by police from this date to this date, or 17 trans people were killed during these days. You na you na it's like a liturgy. It's, it's spiritual, it's religious. My, so my question is, say their names. Why, why is that important? Help us understand that. Thank you, Art, that's a great question. And thankfully, I have an answer to that because I was talking to Hannah a bit about this uh, before my talk. So at some point in, in my research mode for this book, I made a very conscious decision to almost exclusively cite black women, women of color um, in, in, in all of the footnotes. And I thought that that would be what enough for me. I thought, okay, if I'm sourcing women who have done this work, if I'm sourcing black and brown women, then that should be enough. And then I realized that's not enough because we need to name the people who have suffered the most. We need to name the lives that have been lost because this is a part of that work. We can't forget, and that's part of the problem in our church and country. We don't name, we don't name history how it actually happened. And I wanted this to in many ways, it's a creative project because I talk about my life, my spiritual journey, and I get really creative um, in, in my writing style. But in many other ways, this, I wanted this to serve as a kind of historical timeline for people to say, oh, these things happened because we read about this and she cites this. And it was important for me to uplift those women who had been lost and uplift people who might have gotten a mention in mainstream media or in Catholic media and then gotten forgotten about. And for me, I wanted this to, in whatever way it could be, be a testament to their memory. And for me, 
this is what storytelling is. Storytelling is about my community. And in order for me to build my community and in order for me to honor my community, then remembrance has to be a part of that. And so that's why it was so important for me to name those names. And it was actually really difficult in the editing process because I kept having to go back to my editor and say, no, I want to add these names. I want to add this other name because it's important for people to see those names because I haven't forgotten those names. I haven't forgotten these people, not just because I wrote a book, but because this is a community of people who have been marginalized. And for me, I wanted to give them, even in death, the power that they deserved because their voices and their experiences mattered because they were human beings with dignity. And I wanted to make sure that Catholics remembered that. Yes. Thank you, Olga. This is wonderful. Uh, I'm Tim Moothart from uh, representing Coalition for Nonviolence here in Dubuque and also Presentation Lantern Center. Uh, in your research, did you find any uh, Catholic church leaders, men or women, who are role models for us to act as anti racists for acting anti-racism? And if so, who are they and how would you suggest that we support them? Yeah, that's a really great question. So I have one in particular that um, was really, really helpful for me, again, at a time when I was really frustrated with the whiteness of the church. And this was a, a Catholic community in Harlem that I found. Someone suggested it. Um, and it's called St. Charles Barmeo in, in Harlem. I can't remember the exact address. But they do some of the best conversations from the pulpit that I have ever experienced in Catholic spaces. And the last time I was there, obviously pre-pandemic, I haven't been back in person. But pre-pandemic, this was one of the few spaces that said, no, we're going to talk about the black LGBTQ community. We're going to about talk about the trans community. And we're going to call on people to do that work. And so St. Charles Barromeo is a wonderful example of what it looks like to do that work, to do grassroots work, but to also do um, for priests to talk from the pulpit. And I think that is one example of a community that I would encourage folks to tune into their live stream and to support them. A lot of their, um, the groups that they founded throughout the years are really, really good at that. Dick Smith from Resurrection Parish. Um, I think you touched on my comment, um, on my question previously a little bit. Um, I think I don't hear homilies anymore um, that touch me. Mm -hmm. Sometimes I do. But there's a hesitancy to avoid political issues. But then what is a priest supposed to do about addressing social justice issues? Yeah, I think the advice I have, because I get this question a lot, I think that is where part of the work has to come in. If you are attending a space that in the past year your pastor has not talked about the Black Lives Matter movement, your pastor has not talked about abolition, immigration rights, the LGBTQ plus community, then you, especially as a white Catholic man and all, again, all white allies, then I think the onus is on you to demand that they do that work because that's part of that, again, that's part of the work that we have to do and just challenge them to say, hey, I'm struggling. I'm struggling to get involved in this social justice work. I'm struggling to think about this movement. It's really complicated because it's not an easy, there's a lot of valid criticisms of the movement and you need to be able to, as a Christian community, engage in that. So I just say challenge them because there's no excuse for that. There's no excuse for not helping your congregation think about social justice if you are a Catholic space. Just challenge them. Um, you talk in your book about um, the connection between Catholic social teaching and the Black Lives Matter movement, and you say that the Black Lives Matter movement is like a secular version mm -hmm. of Catholic social teaching, and I'd love if you could speak more to that connection that you see there. Yeah, thank you. Um, so for me, the connection exists because here are two seemingly different organizations, for lack of a better word, 
um, that are talking about the same thing, right? Catholic social teaching tells us to be in solidarity with oppressed persons, to fight for workers' rights, to fight for life, right? We're a pro-life church, and this is what the movement is also promoting. The movement is saying, hey, let's center black and brown queer women and men, black and brown trans women and men who are marginalized, who are ignored. And this movement is saying, hey, let's give them their dignity. Let's fight for workers. Let's build a world where everyone is free. And to me, that is Catholic social teaching right there. It's calling us to create these spaces and to make people feel safe in their church. I think a lot of people don't realize that many of us don't feel safe in this church. And this movement is fighting to create a world where people, where our human dignity is truly valued. And that is what Catholic social teaching, that is what doctrine teaches us, that we're supposed to give humans the God-given dignity and rights that they deserve. And this is where, to me, the movement, the movement and, and our faith overlap. This is a question for clarification. Somewhere near the end of the presentation, you made a comment and called out um, persons who voted for Trump. Would you go back to that and please give me that, that little context again? I'm not sure what you were saying. Oh, yeah, so I was saying that one of the um, one of the consequences of white supremacy is that oppressed groups also internalize a lot of the norms of our oppressors, which is why you have Latinos who voted for Trump, right? That was a, that's been a really big story throughout his papacy and even last year. And it, again, it is because we internalize the very norms of our oppressors. And so that is why you have people within my own community who could see someone causing so much harm and still think, oh, but he's fighting for a lot of the pro-life things that I'm fighting for. And so that's what I meant by that. This is why we exist on an ideological spectrum. And this is why media and Catholic spaces need to create this, the, need to create room for us to acknowledge that, right? Because that doesn't exist in our church right now. And this is why so many people in these communities are gravitating farther to the right because there's something there that they're not finding in these spaces. And so that is me inviting Catholic spaces, Catholic churches, universities, et cetera, to make room for those conversations to happen, for that tension to exist. So I hope that clarified it a bit. Hello, my name is Nina Urba, and I'm running for Mayor of Dubuque. And for, before I get to my question, I just want to say that everything that you talked about, police brutality, imperialism, all that kind of stuff, that is why I'm running for mayor, because all of those things have gone as far as infecting Dubuque, and I am running to end every one of those social ills that we've got. Um, my question then is, how do, you f how do you find it within yourself to maintain hope that we're making progress on these issues when we're bombarded by negative images, not just about police brutality, but yesterday, Border Patrol agents were rounding up Haitian refugees who mm -hmm. came here because of the earthquake that happened. And these border agents looked like patrolmen rounding up slaves. Mm -hmm. It looked like something straight out of the 19th century. And somehow, people think that it's OK to circulate those images. So how do you find hope that we're making progress in light of that? Yeah, thank you. Um, that's a really great question. So. How I find hope is, one, the liberatory spaces that I mentioned I, with other women of color in this church, that is where hope lies for me. So when I'm at my most uh, devastated, these are the spaces that fulfill me and that really empower me to keep doing this work. And secondly, I find hope in a lot of the, I do a lot of work with grassroots organizers in the Bronx, and they give me hope because they help me understand that any kind of revolution that is supposed to happen is happening. It's just, again, these are not the stories that are told. These are not the people that are centered. These are not the voices that you're going to see at the New York Times or the Wall Street Journal. So I find hope in being plugged into these local spaces where I'm being challenged and, and I'm learning from these folks. And they're really helping me believe that even if I don't see it in my lifetime, generations 
after, after my generation, after my kids' generation, they will. So that's, that's where I find hope. Since I have the mic, oops, glasses. Since I have the mic, um, while the rest of you think for some other questions, uh, maybe I'll um, just ask put these back on. Uh, something that you mentioned earlier towards the beginning, um, feeling alienated from the church that you grew up in, um, and then becoming sort of awakened to the racial justice movement you started getting involved in, and then the, the racism in the church itself. And I was thinking of lots of us in this room of all ages, uh, maybe feeling alienated from the churches we grew up in for various reasons, and yet you kind of went back towards the church and towards your faith why do you think you did that rather than, than leaving a church that, that has so much baggage and so much injustice and that um, hurt you in so many ways? Yeah, thanks, Dave. That's a, a really great question. So I, again, I think that my reporting on this movement really helped me to recognize that I had the tools to change my church. Even if it was one article at, one article at a time, one tweet at a time, I had the tools to be able to start at least calling these things out, at least naming the folks who are doing this, this type of oppression in our church. And recognizing that and then talking to other black and brown women who are also struggling, but who are also saying, you know what? This is my home too. This is my home and I can create the church that I want and we will create the church that I want. That's why I stay because to me, Catholicism has shaped me since I arrived in this country, and it's also given me um, the tools for liberation that I wouldn't have had otherwise, but I also know that it has to change, and believing in that change, this also ties into your question about where I find hope, I believe that we can change it. Again, it might not happen in my lifetime, but it will happen because it's the gospel, right? That at the, at the end of the day, no matter whether you're Protestant or Catholic, we're talking about the gospel, right? We're talking about Jesus. We're talking about building a world that's more Christ-like, and that's why I stay, because this is not the church. This is not the best of our church. The best of our church is yet to come, and if I were to leave, then that would be one less person that's gonna call out every racist bishop or priest that's doing really racist and oppressive things, so that's why I stay. Thank you. Um, my name is McKenna Smith. I'm the new assistant director of campus ministry at Clark. Um, my question, first off, I loved your talk and I'm sitting here in tears, but my um, question for you is because I work with students and because I'm on the young millennial side myself, and like I've grown up with Black Lives Matter and the different movements, but something I've always felt uncomfortable as a white woman about is I want to be a good ally, but I don't know how to start those conversations because they're not my lived experience. Mm -hmm. And so how do I go back to my students and say, I really want to be there for you, but I don't, like, I, I'm going to buy your book after this too, but I mean, like, I want to find ways that I can give them resources and be there for them and show up for them and also create conversations with their white peers and say, this is something you should care about too. And I want to know your suggestions on how I do that. Yeah, I think... Part of that is, one, just providing resources for students, right? Students love when educators, et cetera, give them these resources. So I think pointing them to work that's really going to challenge them, that's really going to force them to confront a lot of the things that we've been, we've been talking about today. Um, and secondly, just, just listen. Just say, hey, I'm listening. You know, I have had many moments in this church where I have just wanted a white woman to listen to me. You know, I have just wanted someone to say, hey, I'm really, really sorry that that awful thing happened to you. And that's what you can do, because you're never going to have their lived experience, but what you can do is listen to them and let them know that it is not okay that they experience that, you know? And I think that, that is how you help them, just listen. Just create that space where they can be open about it. Because in my experience, a lot of what's happened to me is I have tried in predominantly white spaces to share my experience and the way that I've been treated has made me retreat and become cynical and think, oh, okay, so that means I can't trust white people because they're just gonna tell me I'm being dramatic or they're just gonna tell me that I'm being overly sensitive. So what you can do is just tell them, hey, I'm sorry. I'm sorry that this is happening, but I'm here and just create that space for them.
Any other questions for Olga? Uh, well then, before we thank her one more time, I know, hold off. Uh, I just want to remind you a couple of quick things. One, you've had the appetizer, the full meal is in the book. Uh, it's in the back, <laughs> buy it. Uh, she's happy to sign it. Uh, thank you, thank you so much for coming in person. Um, hopefully, hopefully, uh, it'll be even more uh, back to semi-normal next time and we'll have even more people and we won't be wearing masks. And, uh, so, but, but thank you so much for coming. And of course, let's thank Olga one more time for sharing her wisdom. <laughs> Thank you. Have a good night, everyone. <laughs>